Think about which one of these statements best represents you. We are all equal, or some of us are better or worse. The poor need our help, or the poor lack motivation. All religions are equal, or my religion is better. Live for the moment, or plan for tomorrow. Criminals need reform, or criminals need punishment. Emotions should be expressed, or emotions generally should be under control. In fact, you believe all of these positions, and so do I. Today we're here to describe a new philosophical theory presented in our book, which is going to explain how this is possible. It explains how and why so many contradictory feelings, attitudes, and laws change over time. 200 years ago, if a woman was raped and became pregnant, we'd kill the rapist and spare the baby. Today, we spare the rapist and abort the baby. How do we imagine the moral position of the majority of people flipped so completely in such a short period of time? Centuries ago, many cultures condoned polygamy, but today we put people in jails for it. 100 years ago, we approved of only heterosexual marriage, and homosexuals were often sentenced to prison for years of hard labor. In 1895, Oscar Wilde was sentenced to prison for sexual indecency for being homosexual. Were we wrong before and have somehow become enlightened to a more correct view of human relationships? Today, many political and social leaders are celebrating the homosexual lifestyle and openly supporting gay marriage. How could our moral outlook flip so dramatically in only a few generations? How could something that was so wrong yesterday be right today, and what was so right yesterday be wrong today? Until now, there's been no clear systematic explanation on why and how moral standards change. Most people think it's simply a matter of opinion or social forces beyond explanation. How could it make sense that America's founders believed they were fighting for liberty while also owning slaves? Or demand the vote for men while having no problem denying it to women? Why was dueling in the streets once considered an activity of noble honor, while today is dismissed as mere despicable violence? With the development of the theory and philosophy of dual morality, these enigmas are not only explained but are discovered to be a necessary step in social and moral development. The theory is fully laid out in the book, Our Human Herds. It details many of the monumental conflicts and contradictions we've faced in history. It explains why moral debates take shape as they do. For instance, should we try to rehabilitate criminals or punish them? Should we outlaw abortions or fund them? Should we have a national health care system or return to privately funded medicine? Should we raise minimum wage or eliminate it? The book suggests that these conflicts originate inside each and every one of us. That each of us is morally divided. And it is from our own internal conflicts that our broader social struggles begin because each of us has the potential to believe any of these positions and the ability to feel that either of these positions can be right. As the most mentally developed creature, we enjoy and sometimes suffer from a host of competing mental processes. We're both the most rational of animals and the most irrational. Our loves and our hates are more complex, our joys more elating, and our fears more terrifying. We imagine and dream more than any other animal, as well as cooperate or fight between our groups. With such complexity of mind, it's not surprising that we express the most sophisticated moral makeup of all creatures. Humans, like other living things, are equipped with senses which examine the world in multiple ways. We have tongues to taste with and eyes to see with. But tasting and seeing are not singular and simple things. The tongue has the ability to discern sweet from sour and salty from spicy. By giving our one sense of taste multiple dimensions, we're better able to discern the foods that were good for us from those which are questionable. We do not just see, we see things in color and in three dimensions. The ability to discern red from green as well as far from near allows us to better navigate fruits in distant trees or avoid lions in the tall grass. In the same vein, human morality is not just one thing, it is two. We have two general ways to feel right and wrong. And because we have two ways, we are better able to navigate the social world of which we are part. The fundamental proposition of the theory of dual morality is that our moral outlook is divided and we are equipped with a moral ability to see right and wrong in two different ways. 
the morality of plenty versus the morality of scarcity. Throughout all time, humans have had to survive under one or the other of two overriding circumstances. Either there was enough food, shelter, and protection for everyone to survive, or there wasn't. And what the book explains is that it is from this radical root of cold, hard reality that everything we know of human morality has sprung. Either we have enough for all, or we don't. Here's another thought experiment. If we have enough food, shelter, and protection for everyone to survive, what is the most morally right thing to do? A. Share what we have so that all of our group does survive. Or B. Distribute food and protection so that only some of our group can survive and others die. Certainly the morally correct answer for most would be A. When we all can survive, we all should survive. But what about when there's not enough for all? What if food and resources were so scarce that sharing with everyone equally meant most would die? What if the only way any of our group can survive is if we ensure some of us have enough food and shelter and the rest have far less? Animals solve this problem by a simple formula of having the strong and most well-adapted survive. The younger, weaker, or older often fail to make it. This process of natural selection was undoubtedly at work on our ancestors for hundreds of thousands of years. The very old, the very young, or the weak would simply be killed or die. Then, somewhere in pre-human history, something changed. It was recognized that in times of danger, want, or hunger, it was not always best that the oldest and youngest died. The former possessed valuable experience and remembered the lessons of the past, and the latter were our future. What if a group found ways to ensure that when everyone couldn't make it, the few who were to give up their lives were the most expendable and the least valuable as measured in other ways? And the ones who were guaranteed to be preserved were the wisest and most technically or socially skilled. This group would certainly have a survival advantage over other groups who only relied on the animalistic approach. What happened was that human society began to organize itself by priorities expressing who was more valuable and who was less so. What developed in our distant past was a moral outlook which came to understand that in times of scarcity, where only a percentage of the group can make it, it's imperative that social structures exist to be sure that the most valuable survive. In times of hardship, it's the belief in the uneven distribution of goods that has to ensure human survival. These, I propose, are the two foundational outlooks of our dual morality. In times of plenty, when we all can survive, sharing and equality becomes the paramount social value. In times of hardship and want, when only some of us can survive, it's imperative that these be the strongest, smartest, most well-trained, bravest, and most valuable so that the wisdom, knowledge, and skills accumulated by the group and possessed by them can be passed down onto its survivors. These two moral outlooks developed within each and every one of us. Just as a tongue developed to experience many tastes or the eyes which evolved to see multiple colors, being able to feel right and wrong in more than one way was a survival advantage. So each and every one of us can see right and wrong in either of these two moral patterns. In the book, these are referred to as mind one and mind two. Mind one is our moral pattern of plenty. Mind two, the moral pattern of scarcity. The book will lay out that it is from the interplay and conflict of these two moral minds that all human social dilemmas arise and all moral battles are fought. It will explain why it is that sometimes we see good and right as equality for all, and other times we're forced to see right as some getting more than others. Most importantly, it will show how we can find either position as right or wrong, depending on our circumstance. The theory explains much more than political or social conflict. Through it, we finally have answers for perplexing aspects of human social understanding. Here's another thought experiment. If I were to ask you to explain the difference between personality and character, what might you say? If a friend describes their co-worker as having a great personality, but being short of character, or having a good character but not much in the way of personality, you'd know what they meant, but you would probably have a hard time explaining it. The theory would show how each moral mind comes to define the world in slightly different ways. Each of our moral outlooks creates its own vocabulary through which we categorize each other. After reading the book, you will be able to easily separate these seemingly similar terms into two very different and distinct moral meanings. Even the most complex of emotions are decoded within its bindings. The feeling of guilt or self-doubt is now understood to be the internal struggle of one moral mind having conceded to the other. The book builds upon the ideas of philosophers of the past. 
It addresses the goals of Plato, laid out in his famous work, The Republic. It takes from Western philosophers like Aristotle and historians like Plutarch, as well as from Eastern thinkers like Confucius and concepts like the yin and yang. It will also show how all of these thinkers, Eastern and Western, were using different ways to describe the same basic things everyone experiences. In this book, we unite their efforts. We will discover how and why dictatorships and monarchies evolve into democracies, and how, as with the ancient Romans or with the Italian maritime republics, democracies can also fall back into dictatorships, and that governance, like marriage or the death penalty, is a biological expression. It connects the aims and outlooks of political theorists like Karl Marx and Ludwig von Mises, who, on the surface, seem diametrically opposed to one another. It unifies the thinking of neo-socialist economists like Maynard Keynes with the mercantilists like Jean-Baptiste Colbert with neo-libertarians like Adam Smith. Inexorably, we will link the communists and the fascists, the democrats with the republicans, the capitalists with the socialists, masculinity with femininity, the prince with the pauper, and eastern mysticism with western objectivism. It'll show why our politicians struggle over butter or guns, our educators over job training or standardized testing, and what the difference is between like and love. It even looks at how and why expecting a woman to be a virgin on her wedding night can be valued as essential in one century and oppressive in another. Ultimately, the theory will explain clearly why our internal moral systems give rise to both the atheist and the believer. In the end, we will understand both the bikini and the burqa, and how each can be morally right. It will show how and why none of these moral positions were wrong, and in fact, it will demonstrate how they were all right, but that they were not all right at the same time, and for the same reasons. Ultimately, the book examines the nature of truth and how it differs from fact. We will learn why we have both these terms, and how our dual mind uses facts in one way and truths in another. We will discover that the meaning of life is the process of turning our desires into reality, our irrationalities into rationalities, and our truths into facts. We're committed to both aspects of our dual morality, and though our two sides are often conflicted, we want both sides to win where they can. We seek both pleasure and happiness. We want to reform the criminals and to punish them to have high standards for our children in school while also trying to ensure that everyone passes, of vowing to be committed to our spouse until death do us part and yet allow for divorces too. Our human herds explains definitively why we believe that some people are more beautiful than others while also believing that beauty is only skin deep and in the mind of the beholder. To borrow a phrase from physics, dual morality is a unified field theory of all human activity. This is more than a speculative work in sociobiology. It is a comprehensive system of fundamental philosophy designed to continue the conversations begun by Pythagoras and Socrates, continued through Hobbes and Hegel, and applied to everyday lives by Martin Luther and Martin Luther King. Armed with an ability to see correctness from two vantages, our dual morality can find right as the group sacrificing for the individual or the individual sacrificing for the group. We can have it both ways. We are all for one, and then again, we are one for all. Using the insights of so many thinkers before us, we discover how right and wrong come into being, how they are applied, and why right is right, why wrong is wrong, and most importantly, why right can also be wrong at the very same time. For more information, go to the website dualmorality.com and buy the book Our Human Hurts at amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com.